I will speak a bit of radio surgery and our philosophy on uh, large vestibular schwannomas. So, a couple of uh, introduction slides related to radio surgery. Uh, we know now that we have uh, quite extended experience in this pathology. Uh, we have a very long uh, term clinical and scientific track record, and we actually have papers uh, showing results of more than 10 years. There has been a de escalation of dose prescription, uh, and it was a New England Journal of Medicine paper by the group in Pittsburgh showing that currently, with a range of doses between 11 and 14 grays, uh, we have a very high long term control, up to 97%. And also, we have uh, an improved clinical outcome. Uh, so the risk of facial palsy is less than 1% uh, or very low and hearing preservation for these patients who have a high level of hearing at baseline goes up to 70% during the long-term follow-up. Uh, so it has become in most of the center a standard of care for the uh, medium, small and medium-sized tumors. And our strategy for the last, I think, 15 years, uh, because we had a linear accelerator before and starting 2010, we had a gamma knife, uh, was uh, for small intracranalicular tumors like this to do other follow-up imaging uh, if there was no uh, growth, or either treat them up front with radio surgery uh, if they had a high level of hearing at baseline based mainly on Marseille paper. For CUS, Two and three grades, which are these patients, we perform upfront radio surgery, and we usually don't do surgery if we don't have a major brainstem compression or uh, major clinical symptoms. And for CUS uh, grade four, we believe it's an indication of surgery. We uh, had learned that we have a couple of predictors. Of course, as Dr. Chernov was saying in this presentation, is just a side we see. There are many other predictors, definitely, which we need to take into account when we do a radiosurgical planning. One is the cochlear dose, uh, which is ranging between four to five grays um, in most of the reports for a good hearing preservation after. Uh, as Dr. Chernov nicely showed also, we uh, have made a paper on the vestibular dose, uh, which should be kept uh, below 8 grays. And we also uh, do a multimodal imaging in every radiosurgical planning. We try to identify where is the facial nerve, where is the vestibular cochlear nerve, and we spare this from the uh, dosimetry planning. One of the problems we have in single session radio surgery is the volume. Uh, we know that if we have a small volume, we have a small penumbra. Once you increase the target volume, you increase your zone of penumbra and you increase your complications mainly and your uh, efficacy decreases. So uh, we are facing these patients who have large tumors and are not suitable for upfront radio surgery. Uh, they have symptoms, they have a huge volume at baseline and they are a surgical indication. But the problem is most of them who are coming to our centers, they have uh, high expectations with regard to the preservation of function after the surgery. So uh, what we are trying to do is to uh, decrease a high volume of a patient who has a CUS4 vestibular schwannoma to a small volume, which is becoming a target which is feasible for radio surgery in a second time. Why do we need a subtotal approach, at least in our philosophy and in our experience? You have here a paper from the Hanover group of Majid Sami, who has an extended experience. And you can see for the uh, normal facial nerve after surgery, uh, ranges between 25 and 63%. This was a classification depending on the tumor uh, size at baseline, more and less than four centimeters. And we have the challenges of hearing preservation. Uh, that's a, a team from Germany, and you can see uh, hearing preservation was around 42% after surgery. We had this Swiss paper just coming uh, recently, neurosurgery, uh, which is from Basel Group, and they did uh, an intenternial total removal in 44 patients, and extent of resection more or less 90%, so small remnants. Uh, oncological control, 84%. So uh, we believe this needs to be improved. Uh, 
So we developed, in collaboration with Roy Daniel, who is doing the skull-based surgery in our department, uh, these combined approaches, uh, which are aiming mostly at conserving the fi facial and the cochlear nerve function. And uh, you can see here an example of such case with a huge tumor, major brainstem compression, and she had uh, a trigeminal neuralgia at baseline and a long tract symptoms. Uh, under electrophysiological guidance, we inspect the capsule, so we do an intracapsular decompression, and in our experience, when we have a stimulation around 2 to 4 milliampers, the um, thickness of the internal capsule is around uh, 3 to 4 millimeters. So then we stop. Then we see these patients with a follow-up MRI between 3 to 9 months. I think you'll see in my next slides that it depends a bit on the uh, post-operative tumor volumes uh, and the clinical uh, shape of the patient. Uh, and then we have the folding of this capsule, which becomes, at least in our experience, a good target for gamma knife or for radio surgery in general in a second time. That's a typical example. That's, I think, one of our nice cases. You have the preoperative MRI uh, with the Coos grade for tumor. You can see the MRI done uh, just the day after the surgery, and then the six months follow-up MRI where this has fallen down by the CSF pulsations mainly. So at this time, we do radio surgery. That's again the same case. Uh, you can see it very nice. and. Uh, if we discuss volumes, as uh, Jan Padik was saying, uh, because we are not fitting only to, uh, to sizes, you can see 24 cubic centimeters here in preoperative, and three years after gamma knife, 1.24, the patient was fine, uh, facial nerve was preserved. Then in the cases where we uh, need to preserve our soul hearing in patients who have a normal hearing at baseline, then it's becoming, at least in our hands, a little bit more difficult in the sense that, uh, and you'll see this again on my uh, next slides, the post-operative volumes we need to leave in are a little bit higher. And that's a typical example of a patient with a normal hearing at baseline. She had a trigeminal neuralgia, uh, intractable to medication, so she had surgery. Uh, six months post-operative volume, it's uh, nice, but it's not as smaller as the other one you have seen in the, the other slide. These are audiometry tests uh, who show hearing preservation of this patient. Uh, and finally, uh, three years after gamma knife, she still had useful hearing, so we were uh, happy of the result. We have recently uh, reviewed our experience over a period of almost seven years with this approach. Uh, you can see most of our radiosurgical activity are vestibular schwannomas, around 30%. And 40 patients had a combined approach. Uh, and on these patients, uh, facial nerve was normal at baseline in uh, 39 patients. And one patient had a house Brackman grade 4 at baseline. Half of them had also useful hearing. Uh, and you can see here uh, the microsurgical cohort. Uh, 34 patients had first treatment. Uh, we were discussing about gamma knife failures and radiosurgery failures, so we had four failures in our vestibular schwannoma radiosurgical treatment who had microsurgery. One was post-linear uh, accelerator and one was post-fractionated uh, radiotherapy. And we had three cases, and I think that's important, who had stage surgery because we did consider that the volume which was left in place after the first surgery was too high to be able to perform radio surgery. And that's a little bit part of our learning curve, I would say, during the past seven years. Then you can see here the, the radio surgical, the macrosurgical results, sorry. Uh, we had no facial palsy in this, in this preliminary analysis. And for the patient who had a normal hearing at baseline, uh, we had around 80% of them uh, keeping a normal hearing after the surgery and after radio surgery. This is an important slide because here it illustrates a little bit the uh, remaining post-operative volumes for the facial nerve preservation alone or for facial, sorry, and cochlear nerve preservation. And you can see here the residual volume when we wanted to conserve only the facial nerve was around 26% uh, of the initial volume. 
but in the uh, court where we tried to preserve hearing, it was uh, sensibly uh, higher, and this was statistically significant. Now the gamma knife experience, so we usually, as I was saying, we perform this uh, around six months after the microsurgical resection. We prescribe between 11 to 12 grays, depending on the contact or not with the brainstem. So if we have a contact with the brainstem, we prescribe uh, 12 grays and 11 grays was a little bit in uh, higher tumor volumes. You have here the overall residual volume after surgery, which was 31%, uh, and we had the follow-up which went up to 16 months, 16 months af afterwards. The mean volume at last follow-up was uh, decreased as compared to this one, so around 20%. We had no new cranial nerve deficits and we had free uh, ventricular peritoneal shunts. All these patients who had shunts uh, had high protein level in the cerebral spinal fluid. And I think this has been already demonstrated in a couple of papers. Uh, including by the Hanover group or SAMI, is that uh, some of these patients will have high protein levels in the CSF and they will need a shunt at a certain moment. Then we tried to compare this with our whole series of CUS free. We took the CUS free uh, as having a similar volume with the uh, larger volume in this combined approach series. And at three years, uh, we considered we had more failures uh, in the combined approach group. Uh, and I think, again, this is part of our learning curve and this is getting better. But these are the fair results we need to present. So the patients number 3, 9 and 11 in this series had these uh, failures. You can see uh, that the second combined approach was performed between uh, 1.3 years and 2.6 years. Of course, here we can discuss whether this was pseudo-progression or not, but I think the problem in this series, at least, is that patients were symptomatic, so we couldn't afford to wait. Uh, and that was a very important aspect. And we had one shunt in this series. Um, that's one of the cases of failure. This was a patient who had a preserved hearing I uh, showed you before. This was before the first surgery, and we had 11.3 uh, cubic centimeters. This was at the time of the first GKS, uh, the first radio surgery, 4 cubic centimeters. And then the tumor grew back again, and the patient had the uh, symptomatic trigeminal neuralgia, so we couldn't wait anymore. It was uh, unbearable, and she had been operated and uh, had the second uh, gross target volume of 2.5 cc. The same patients at uh, two years after the second gamma knife, I just saw her recently in the consultation was fine and she still had useful hearing uh, as it was the time before. Of course, we are not the only one who are doing this. Uh, for the interest of time, I just uh, selected a couple of uh, papers. You can see uh, this is a Dutch team from Groningen showing mainly uh, facial nerve normal function was preserved in around 60% of their experience. Uh, but they are doing near total resection, so they are uh, leaving small remnants in place, and that I think is important. That's another philosophy, is different. That's a slide I borrowed from Michael Schulder in New York. Uh, you can see uh, they have just published last year in stereotactic and functional they, their approach on this type of tumors, and they are leaving small remnants in place and doing radio surgery at a period which varies between three to six months after surgery. Uh, they have also uh, showed an algorithm they are using, uh, which is mainly related to tumor size uh, and grade of CUS. Uh, we don't do fractionated radiotherapy uh, or fractionated uh, radio surgery because we believe the results are the same as in single fraction for the volumes we need. That's a slide from the group in Marseille. Uh, Pierre Ugroche is a very good skull based surgeon, and uh, in his hands, with the same type of approach, he has a facial nerve preservation rate in the early series of around 80%. And I think that's a fair result and 90% in the group 2008-2010. Uh, you can see uh, the remnant is leaving in place is much uh, lower than in our series. Again, that's a different philosophy just to illustrate. Uh, we can do it differently depending on how the group is feeling. And if we see the overall uh, preservation of the facial nerve, it ranges between 85 to 100 percent in the series which are published up to date, which are these ones, and the tumor control is between 79 to 100 percent. I think 
one of the main problems we have with this type of approach, at least in my uh, way of seeing the things, you see we have short-term follow-up going up to uh, more or less 68 months. I think we need to have 10 years, 5 years of these patients, 15 years, and then we can see if this is a way of doing it or not, and how can we improve in these patients. Uh, we started to apply this to other cranial nerve schwannomas. Uh, also, you can see here a large preoperative volume, smaller at the time of GKS and shrank uh, three years after. So we are extending this to other uh, cranial nerve schwannomas also. Dr. Martinez will speak about this uh, during the next session. So at least in our uh, series with the small number of patients we had in the short-term follow-up, we had no impairment of the facial nerve function. We had a high level of hearing preservation on short-term basis. Uh, and now I think we have, and I was speaking about this, new, new dosimetry and planning challenges because we have this irregular shape we need to, to deal with. We have the uh, hearing preservation we need to keep. And uh, certainly it will allow to match uh, the approach and uh, the expectation of upfront uh, radiosurgery in the future. Thank you for your attention.